Day 128 of the war in Gaza and the IDF is continuing ongoing operations in and around Khan Yunus. But at the same time, the Prime Minister has ordered the army to turn its attention toward Rafah, the last remaining Hamas-held city with a mostly displaced population of 1.3 million. And now to be Steve Leibovich reports. In the southern Gaza city of Khan Yunis, the IDF Commando Brigade and the Paratroopers Brigade operated in the western part of the city, raiding remaining Hamas sites and killing dozens of Hamas operatives. Troops seized weapons and equipment. But attention is turning further south, and the coming attack on the last remaining Hamas stronghold in the southernmost city of Rafah on the Egyptian border, teeming with 1.3 million mostly displaced Gazans. IDF Chief of Staff Halevi and the head of the Shin Bet Ronen Bar met commanders of the 98th Division for an assessment meeting deep inside Khan Yunus to plan the next moves in the war. Prime Minister Netanyahu said that victory is within sight. Victory is within reach. We're going to do it. We're going to get the remaining Hamas terrorist battalions in, in Rafak, which is the last bastion. But we're going to do it, and in this I agree with the Americans, uh, we're going to do it while providing safe passage for the uh, civilian population so they can leave. Israel has announced that southern Gaza civilians will be given time to leave Rafah before the IDF launches ground forces to capture the city. Those plans are being finalized. Located along the Egyptian border, Rafah is refuge to an estimated 1.3 million civilians, many living in makeshift tent camps or overflowing UN-run shelters, evacuated earlier from areas captured by the IDF in northern and central Gaza. Prime Minister Netanyahu explained that those opposed to Israel taking Rafah did not want Israel to win the war. The areas that we've cleared north of Rafah are uh, plenty of areas there. But uh, we are working out a detailed plan to do so. And that's what we've done up to now. We're not, uh, uh, we're not cavalier about this. This is part of our war effort to get civilians out of harm's way. It's part of Hamas's effort to keep them in harm's way. But we've so far succeeded, and we're going to succeed again. Those who say that under no circumstances should we enter Rafah are basically saying, lose the war, keep Hamas there. The White House expressed doubts about the Israeli plans said, uh, given the circumstances and the conditions there that we see right now, uh, we think a military operation at this time would be a disaster for those people. Egypt warned Israel that mass displacement of Palestinians into its territory would put the country's decades-long peace agreement and close security ties at risk. The Egyptian foreign minister said there are great risks in Rafah and warned that the escalation would have dire consequences. And joining us now is former member of Knesset, an expert on foreign policy and the Middle East, Ruth Wasserman Lande. Ruth, Prime Minister Netanyahu is telling the world we're preparing to move on to Rafah. The U.S. and Egypt are warning not to do so. Can Israel win the war on Hamas without really capturing Rafah, as the Prime Minister claims? Actually, uh, the Rafah crossing and the whole uh, region of Rafiach is critical uh, for the war effort uh, against Hamas because they are the remaining operative, the armed operative of the Hamas actually uh, hiding either above ground in the Rafah area or underground in the tunnels. And as we had already seen uh, more than once, the Hamas uh, operatives are uh, in fact very often dressed as civilian uh, Palestinians and trying to embed themselves amidst the civilian population, which makes it very difficult. Um, the IDF has already um, handled approximately 18, if not more, out of the more or less 24 uh, groups of armed uh de facto army or uh, uh, military forces of the um, organized Hamas uh, groups, but uh, the remainder needs to be taken care of. Otherwise, we've done basically very little uh, because they'll manage to regain their strength, to rearm, and to hurt Israeli civilians once more. You know, the Egyptians are warning that an Israeli attack that forces refugees to break into Egypt will damage the all-important peace treaty with Egypt. That sounds ominous, doesn't it? So, first of all, um, on the one hand, we need to take uh, the Egyptian threats and the Egyptian 
uh, concerns rather than threats very, very seriously because of the importance of the strategic alliance between Israel and Egypt for over four decades. However, um, we need to delve a little bit deeper into what is it that makes Egypt um, concerned. The concern is not uh, because of its uh, worry or regrets vis-a-vis -vis Hamas. It has no regrets vis-a-vis -vis Hamas. It sees it potentially as a Muslim Brotherhood, a threat to its own stability um, and security. Uh, however, um, they are afraid of civilian population, the, the Egyptians, the uh, uh, Palestinian civilian population, which is gathered in the Rafah area because of the IDF actions lower down or more southwards in the center and southwards, um, uh, there is actually um, a, a fear amidst the Egyptians that the um, that the Palestinian Gazans will uh, move or try to uh, make their way even forcefully towards the Sinai Peninsula and into the Egyptian side of the Rafah crossing. This is the main concern of the Egyptians. They don't trust the Hamas. They don't trust the Gazan Palestinian population. And that is why they don't want any Gazan uh, civilians moving into their own territory because they are afraid that this will then be um, manipulated uh, or used by the Hamas in order to create terrorist cells in and within the Sinai Peninsula. That is what worries uh, Egypt. If that worry or concern can be addressed, then it is okay because there is a growing understanding that without the IDF working in that area, in the Rafah area, of course, on the Gazan side and not on the Egyptian side, then the continuation of the smuggling of the weapons will be a uh, uh, inevitable reality. And this is something that uh, Israel cannot possibly allow. With you know, Netanyahu says that the army has been tasked with coming up with a plan for approval. The army says it has plans already. Is this a political and not a military decision? No, it's completely a military position. There is um, a very uh, huge complexity because of the civilian population of the Palestinians uh, in that region, as I had previously explained. However, the remainder of the Hamas battalions, the organized army of the Hamas, with its armament and with its uh, um, intelligence and with everything that it has, which is de facto an army, is in that region, either above ground or below ground. And therefore, this is de facto a military action that needs to take place. Yes, Ruth, thank you so much for joining us today, and uh, stay safe. Thank you. Israeli forces have discovered a tunnel network hundreds of meters long and deep, running partly under UNRWA's Gaza headquarters, proving once again the organization's involvement in terror activities following the major global campaign of countries deciding to defund UNRWA. The IDF uncovered new evidence of collaboration between UNRWA and Hamas in the Gaza Strip, discovering a Hamas tunnel shaft adjacent to a UNRWA school. This is uh, one of the, the, the central commands of the intelligence. These, this place is uh, the Hama, one of the Hamas's intelligence units where they command most of the combat from here, but f f from the underground. We had a walk of uh, approximately 400 meters. Uh, at the depth of uh, 20 meters and before we were in the UNRWA headquarters above on ground now we're underneath the tunnel served as a crucial asset for Hamas military intelligence wing notably the route from the shaft extended beneath UNRWA central headquarters raising serious questions about the agency's involvement Further investigation revealed the presence of electric infrastructure inside the tunnels, showing proof of UNRWA providing resources to Hamas. In response to these findings, the IDF conducted raids on the UNRWA headquarters, where they uncovered a cache of weapons and explosives.
Commissioner General of UNRWA Felipe Lazzarini denied any knowledge of Hamas illicit activities, claiming ignorance of the underground operations. However, his statement was met with skepticism from Israeli officials who demanded his resignation. This is the entrance of the tunnel, and this is the school of the children, the first school that under the tunnel, this is the first com 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 compound, compound yeah, uh, of the engineers and all of their offices. After that, you have a long tunnel. This is, sorry, this is the UMRA headquarters. This is the main building of the UMRA headquarters. And under him, this is the camps. Foreign Minister Israel Katz and Coordinator of Government Activities in the Territories both rejected Lazarini's assertions, accusing UNRWA of turning a blind eye to Hamas exploitation of its premises for terror-related purposes. Israeli envoy to the United Nations Gilad Erdan urged Lazarini to take responsibility and step down, emphasizing the need for accountability in light of the mounting evidence implicating UNRWA in Hamas activities. Experience the power of truth with ILTV News. If you're looking for quality content and captivating visuals, join our news community and become an integral part of our team as we embark on a mission to unveil the real Israel, dismantling the web of lies and misinformation that surround reporting on Israel. By subscribing to ILTV News, you will not only have access to the latest updates, but you will also amplify our message, creating a ripple effect that carries the truth far and wide. Subscribe today and help reshape the narrative. Available on the web, Android, and Apple. And with us now to elaborate on the new IDF findings, the director of the Center for Near East Policy, David Bedin. David, looking at... Thank you at, for having me. Thank you for joining us today. Now, David, looking at the recent findings, seriously, how could UNRWA not know a huge Hamas operations center is right under their headquarters? UNRWA knows exactly what's going on. In, in 2006, I sat there exactly at that, at that UNRWA office with my whole staff interviewing the people of UNRWA after Hamas took over the UNRWA, UNRWA Workers' Union. We issued a report to the European, European Union, European Parliament, excuse me, which, in which this whole thing was spelled out. That report appears on our website, israelbehindthenews.com, under where it says UNRWA reform. And there's a major report. That, uh, that Hamas took over the uh, the union. Now, what's very important about the union, teachers' union and the workers' union, right after that, Canada cut off funding from UNRWA and uh, they, it, it stayed off until Harper lost his position as the prime minister of Canada. But this is not, not uh, this is open sources. There's no no ifs, ands, and buts about it. All the people we've, we've interviewed with in, in in UNRWA over the years, and we've been interviewing UNRWA on this subject since December 1987. Uh, it's very, very clear. They have one position, which is that UNRWA was connected both to the Palestinian Authority and to the UNRWA Workers' Union. Yes, 87 is a long time, and they're in the headlines now again. We, of course, know that UNRWA has been complicit, and some of its workers took part in the October 7 massacre. Can we take action on the ground in Gaza to stop them? Do we have an option? Absolutely. What, what, what Israel can do is to cut off the, what's called humanitarian supplies. What were the first reports we, we issued in the 1980s and early 90s, where we showed that the humanitarian supplies were stolen, were sold on the open market, and traded for guns and other <laughs> non-humanitarian supplies. Very important. There is no supervision. There is no real uh, transparency in UNRWA. And that's the, that's the story that has to come out. I imagine this will come out in whatever investigation takes place after this current war. Why should UNRWA be allowed to handle humanitarian aid, actually? I mean, there's enough evidence by now, even though Commissioner General of UNRWA, the current one, Felipe Lazzarini, although he's denying. I mean, what do you think of that? He can deny. Lazzarini can deny all he wants. The facts speak for themselves. The... the, the, the Humanitarian aid does not get to the Palestinian people. It goes to a terrorist organization called Hamas. Much of the of the equipment coming in is, of course, from Israeli corporations, which creates a very interesting um, uh, interesting conflict of interest for Israel. But but Lazarini has is responsible. He's also responsible. Lazarini is also responsible for the schools being centers of of uh, more or less arsenals 
for the uh, weapons, weapons for ammunition, for, for, for missiles. All this will come out in the investigations after the war. Of course, but what if any alternatives are there to UNRWA on the gr ground, actually, because they're saying it's essential to help Palestinians. Others are saying they're only like a terror organization, large parts of it. What alternatives do you see there are on the ground? Tomorrow morning, the UNRWA, the, the, the Israel Civil Administration could do what it did in the past. Hire social work professionals to go in there that could be Arabic speaking or otherwise. Uh, professionals who are in the world of social work, health, education, etc., can go in there without the incitement. You don't need UNRWA for that. UNRWA has disqualified itself as a humanitarian agency. Very clear. All Israel has to do is to go back to the workings of the Israel, Israel Civil Administration from, from a previous generation, which did see some success in, in monitoring and eliminating and stopping the, uh, the, the turning over of UNRWA into a, into, and nothing, nothing less than a terrorist organization. Lazzarini knows these things very well. Uh, the less, there is no transparency. There is, as, as the, the, the doctors, as the nurses, as the people who, who run medical services in Gaza, and my friend Vivian Silver, one of the people murdered in Barry, she knew this story very well. She was one of the people helping in Gaza with the medical services, but she knew very well. And we had the, these the talks about this many times. I'm also a fellow social worker who's gone into the media. The issue is there's no supervision of medical services from UNRWA. They know there's no accountability. Medicines and uh, uh, building and, and uh, hospital equipment from UNRWA are sold all over the Middle East. That's because there's a lot, no transparency. No transparency, yes. there should be no need. Goodbye, UNRWA. David, more and more evidence is, is coming in, and we can't deny it anymore. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, and you can see our work at israelbehindthenews.com. Thank you. For the first time since the start of the war, U.S. President Joe Biden had lost some criticism of Israeli conduct. The remarks fell short of a call to end the war. Biden called the Israeli response to October 7 over the top and underlined his efforts to achieve a sustained pause in fighting. And Altivis Devo Klein has more. I'm of the view, as you know, that the conduct of the response in, Gaza, in the Gaza Strip has been... Um, over the top. In case there were doubts to his meaning, the White House clarified that the president was referring to Israel. Since the start of the war, Biden has championed military and diplomatic assistance. Now his remarks were focused not on victory in the war, but on humanitarian assistance to the Gazan civilians. He mixed up Egypt and Mexico while describing his efforts. Initially, the president of Mexico, Sisi, did not want to open up the gate to allow humanitarian material to get in. I talked to him. I convinced him to open the gate. I talked to Bibi to open the gate on the Israeli side. I've been pushing really hard, really hard, to get humanitarian assistance into Gaza. The president said that he is now focused on efforts to achieve a sustained pause in fighting and the release of the hostages. Biden took responsibility for the decision to send in fuel, which Israeli leaders have said ends up in the hands of Hamas and its continuing war efforts. I'm the guy that made the case that we have to do much more to increase the amount of material going in, including fuel, including other items. And I'm pushing very hard now to deal with this hostage ceasefire because, as a, you know, I've been working tirelessly in this deal. How can I say this without revealing it? To lead to a sustained pause in the fighting, in the actions taking place in, in the Gaza Strip. In the north, an IDF targeted senior Hamas official and Hezbollah operatives in Lebanon, hitting the car they were riding in some 40 kilometers from the Israeli border. The IDF strike followed heavy Hezbollah barrages in recent days. The northern mayor says enough is enough and demand that the IDF move into Lebanon. ILTV Steve Leibovich has more. The cross-border exchanges between Israel and Hezbollah are now reaching further north and south of the Lebanese border. The Air Force reportedly struck a car filled with terrorists in the coastal town of Jadra, some 40 kilometers north of the Israeli border. Top Hamas official in Lebanon, Basil Salah, reportedly survived the strike but was injured. Two other Hezbollah operatives traveling with him were killed. 
Hezbollah responded with missile fire directly targeting a building in Kiryat Shmona. Damage was caused, but the building was empty and no injuries were caused. Hezbollah is pulled back from the border area for fear of Israeli strikes. In this case, an anti-tank guided missile was fired from several kilometers away and failed to set off alarms in the city. In recent nights, Hezbollah has been firing barrages of rockets toward largely evacuated Israeli towns. Northern residents out of their homes for four months are fed up and are demanding that the IDF protect them from inside Lebanon. Mayors of northern Israeli border towns met with the head of the IDF Northern Command and told him that they were highly skeptical of any potential diplomatic agreement to stop rocket fire. They issued a demand that the army move into Lebanon and serve as a buffer between the civilians and the terrorists. The Gaza war has its implications in various fields. This time, Moody's is downgrading Israel's credit rating, mentioning political instability and potential further escalation with Hezbollah. LTV's William Sharon has the report. The international ratings agency Moody's has downgraded Israel's credit rating from A1 to A2. This move comes as a direct consequence of the ongoing conflict between Israel and Hamas in Gaza. According to Moody's assessment, the war has significantly increased political risk for Israel and weakened its executive legislative institutions and fiscal strength. The agency has also expressed concern about the possibility of escalation with Hezbollah. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu responded to the downgrade, emphasizing the strength of the Israeli economy and attributing the rating change solely to the ongoing war. He expressed confidence that Israel would emerge victorious from the conflict leading to a potential reversal of the rating downgrade. Moody's decision has far-reaching implications for Israel's economic outlook. It reflects concern about increased security risks, raising budget deficits, and potential impact on the GDP growth. The Israeli government is implementing budgetary measures to address the increased defense spending during the war. However, Moody's warns that even these measures, Israel's debt burden is expected to rise significantly in the coming years. The Israeli women's basketball team secures a resounding victory over Ireland at the 2025 Women's Eurobasket qualifier, which didn't go without political tensions that saw the Irish team refrain from the customary handshake. And LTV's Devo Klein has more. An intense showdown took place in the world of women's basketball. In the opening match of the 2025 Women's Eurobasket qualifier, the Israeli women's basketball team triumphed over Ireland with a score of 87 to 57. However, the game was marred by political tensions as the Irish team declined to partake in the customary handshake with their Israeli counterparts. Basketball Ireland stood firmly behind their players, endorsing their decision not to engage in the traditional pre- and post-game rituals. They communicated to the International Basketball Federation their players' intention to abstain from exchanging formalities and standing during the national anthem. This standoff arose from inflammatory remarks attributed to Israeli players accusing the Irish team of anti-Semitism. Israeli basketball player Dol Sal's interview stirred controversy when she suggested anticipation of a strong game due to perceived prejudices. Basketball Ireland, in response, released statements addressing concerns over the ongoing war in Gaza and the potential boycott of the event. Despite the discord, the game continued in Latvia, chosen as a neutral ground amidst the backdrop of war. Looking ahead, Israel prepares to face Latvia, reaffirming their commitment to representing their country with honor and dignity amid these difficult times. Very unprofessional, but well done, our girls. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Clear skies are expected tonight around the country with lows of around 12 degrees Celsius or 54 degrees Fahrenheit. And tomorrow we will see cloudy skies as rain is expected to come again this week with temperatures at highs of 21 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's all for today's news. For more updates from Israel on all your devices, check out our LTV channel, subscribe to our LTV newsletter, and of course, do not forget to check out our new and improved website, ILTV.TV, with all of the latest news from the heart of the state of Israel. I'm Amit Harari. Stay safe and thank you so much for watching.